Well, I am ready to take you on another journey today, and this time we're going to Vietnam. We're going to take a look at another house which God has invited me to build with him. I have learned to grasp that it is not simply having life that determines the quality of our lives. It is learning to let it go, one phase at a time, that determines the measure of our contentment, the value of our insights, and the caliber of our faith. Learning to be more than we have or do is the real beginning of life, and thus God's invitations to continually help to build his houses. In Buddhist terminology, life is the process of becoming awake to what is really real, to what is good, to the foolishness of calling anything final or permanent or necessary or imperative. It is what it is, the Buddha says. Everything is for now, learning to live in the now, seizing it, realizing its value, and honoring its presence in our lives makes for the fullness of life. Any enlightening excursion depends for its fruitfulness on an openness of heart and an awareness of mind. A Sufi story defines the process clearly. Sufi is described as a science whose objective is reparation of the heart and turning it away from all else but God. And the story goes, Tell me what you got from enlightenment, the seeker said. Did you become divine? No, not divine, the Holy One said. Did you become a saint? Oh dear no, the Holy One said. Then what did you become, the seeker asked. And the Holy One answered, I became awake. And so it was in July 1995 that I entered a journey, a new house of the Lord, that has daily awakened me more and more. In fact, I only went to Vietnam for 12 months at that time, but with an urge from my provincial of attempting to set up a developmental prong of the Order of the Loretto Sisters in Australia. My memories of Vietnam up to then were of the late 60s and 70s. Those pictures from my youth, all those faces each day in the morning newspaper and then in moving pictures on the nightly news. Conical hats covering black hair in a bun, toothless women, squat sitting in corners, stirring pots of hot noodle soup. Limbless, shirtless, hairless teenage boys scavenging for a bite to eat in villages with names much harder to pronounce than simple Saigon. Little figures with bamboo poles balancing buckets at both ends, running quick and fast. Dark-eyed infants with oval mouths, caverns to be filled with anything in reach. And then, white men with guns and tanks rolling over a people and a land that would actually one day outwit them. We all gazed long in those days on a people raped and scarred by pain and torture and hunger from one generation to the next, first by their own neighbors, then by the French, and finally by the Americans and their allies. The thing about life is that there is so much of it we never get a chance to see it all at once. But it is everywhere in abundance. Life pours forth, and likewise suffering. Being human means living life on life's own terms, and this entails taking suffering into the bargain. It seems that no one escapes. There is physical suffering, psychological and emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, and suffering brought on by natural disasters. But perhaps the most incomprehensible of all is the suffering brought on by humanity's 
inhumanity to your humanity. Senseless violence, genocide, the barbarism of war and terrorism. However, I have been gifted to see in the Vietnamese people that suffering can be redemptive if and when, in and through it, we give ourselves over to love. There is a tendency to try to explain the horror of unspeakable suffering in religious terms such as God's will or punishment for sin or God's inscrutable ways. These are moments, hard as it may seem, to cling to the truth at the heart of Christian faith and that is God is on the side of life. The power of love will prevail over all evil. And so Vietnam and its people seem to have grasped this, but nothing could have prepared me for what I would see and experience. Saigon teeming with people on motorbikes, and now I'm one of them, mopeds, bicycles, in cyclos, cars, taxis and on foot, all in the streets. A family of four, sometimes five, on a single motorbike. The delivery boy with a hot bowl of noodle soup in one hand and the other hand bracing the centre of the handlebar. A sort of Asian wonder boy, five or six years old, singing even as he holds a half bowl's worth of rice in his mouth, balancing himself on the handlebars of his daddy's hot motorbike. I was swept up, I was carried along in a moving, chaotic, free for all, pushing any and every way where you can get to need to go, a rap line of cacophony and clutter, randomly punctuated, or more often now, by honking and beeping, like those curly accents placed over and there on the quirkily strung words of the tonal language that is Vietnamese. Wooden vegetable stands guarding entry to noodle soup kitchens, hot bowls of pho served for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Pho pots on nearly every street, huddled around by dozens of thin bodies, squatting less than an inch from the ground, their longer-than-life arms hugging bowls, while busy chopsticks work at globs of steaming, foot-long rice noodles. It was not so much the faith of the Vietnamese people that came into focus as much as their livingness, a way of being close to the ground, a heartbeat away from the pulsating earth on which the rest of us would rather stand, trod and trammel, thinking ourselves perhaps somewhere above and unrelated to it. Their squat sitting brings them close to the earth and its ways, reminding me too of where I have come from and where I shall go in the end. This life-ing of a people has been made sinewy strong in affliction. This life-ing of a people, it is so much. The sensuality, the pulsating utter aliveness, the surpassing dignity of their bearing and the majestic contours of that terrain, lush and deep and green and blue and purple. They opened this up to me and they showed it to me. Doing whatever work they can get their hands on Sometimes in their homes, most working hard, 10 hours a day, jobs if they can find them. They are all bonded to one another and to their homeland by a common suffering of struggle and uh, sorrow. For 12 months, I worked for a British non-government organisation called NGO or INGO, and yet I found myself swimming in the memory of Vietnam in war-torn days. It, I was now in this land of a tenacity, a place of sight and sound, of heart and hunger, of suffering and hope, of scent and spirit and spirit. I know more and more that going to Vietnam was an awakening of my heart. And upon waking, of being awakened, perhaps firstly my eyes were opened to see again as if for the first time, but then to look with the eyes of the heart Every movement of the heart is a vital part of my story. The image reflections of Vietnam convey insight about a core feature of the Christian spiritual life, faith and forgiveness, suffering and hope, care for the body and for the poor of the earth, the costliness of fidelity, being rooted in a tradition, 
grief and gratitude, the need for good teaching and direction, the inbreaking of grace in the face of the other. I now know that, if it dares, the heart can learn once again how to love with a love that wants only to love, with a love that pushes out into the vastness of an ever-widening, never ever to be exhausted generosity. It is in Vietnam that my heart could fall in love again, more deeply than ever before. Not with another, but with a people and a land. The sheer joy in living. All connected by blood, by work, and more by a common story. Gradually all this began to soothe me, rather than startle me. I was new to this place, a stranger made welcome in a place which is not a place of all, but an ever-widening circle and cycle of belonging. To go back to a Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds a house, we know that it reminds us to reflect on the type of work we do and why. Was I calling the shots again after I decided and completed my first 12 months in Vietnam? What house was the Lord building for me there where he was calling me to ponder the right reasons for my actions. I knew God was in it. I remember an oasis on a 30 days retreat that I once made on sabbatical in the early 90s, where Jesus and I lay on a very green patch of grass and we talked about everything. We always went back to that spot many times and I still go there. In Vietnam, I often contemplate the words from Paul. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord, in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. And so I was learning in Vietnam a little more to hand over and to realise that God is not only willing but eager to take the burden of final responsibility for whether the house gets built. Work is God given. In the beginning, what's the first word of the Bible? In the beginning, God created, created the heavens and earth. Even our first parents were told to tend the garden and to make it fruitful. So again, in ret retrospect, my first 12 months in Vietnam were the mere foundation. I believe I was then called to a deeper immersion into Christ, which would allow me to do his work in Vietnam. In God, we make our boast all day long. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. He must increase, I must decrease. I'm not going to go into the painful intricacies of the antics of how to gain an INGO license in Vietnam. I just need you to know that it took me 18 months of blood and sweat and tears. I think if I'd known about this very heavy task beforehand, I doubt I'd have laboured with that chapter of God's building the house. However, in September 1997, the Loreto Vietnam Australia program became a registered charity in Vietnam. And now to my favourite part, what do we do? From then until this very day, we have educated some 6,000 poor, disadvantaged vision impaired and intellectually disabled children. From its Latin roots, to educate means to call forth. But what is it precisely that a teacher calls forth? Surely it is the rhythm that springs from the deepest dimension of the person, from the heart, from the place in us, which is not a place at all, that needs to know that the ways of life a forward and backward, up and down and under and then forward again. Educating the heart is aimed at allowing the student body and the student's body to be seized by the rhythm of hope. The Loreto Vietnam Australia program, which I will now call LVAP, which is easier to say, reached out to poor rural countryside areas in the years 97, 99, 2000, 2002, 2003 and 2005 by building four rural primary schools and two kindergartens. Why have we launched to these places? People outside the city are very, very, very poor. 
Textbooks for school students are a luxury 40 kilometers out of the city. Many schools have shift learning. Maybe they have only two classrooms, so years one to three come at seven till nine, they go home. Years three to five come from half past nine to half past 11, they go home. In the afternoon, might be uh, whatever we're up to, six to eight, then they go home, and then from three to four, the older children, and then they go home. So we build and equip schools and then hand them over to the Vietnamese government. This makes them very sustainable projects. I'm pretty sure I can't live forever, but schools will last for scores of years. Our continual support for the kids in these learning environments is given through school packs, uniforms, scholarships for the poorest of the poor, and bicycles also for very poor children. In 1997, we opened a shelter for street girls and one for boys in 1998. Street children in Vietnam are often called bui doi. Bui doi means the dust of life. There isn't much you can do with dust to change its image. It is a graphic symbol of basic nothingness, of powerlessness, of anonymous insignificance. However, through our care of these street kids, giving them security, a home, reliable nutrition, clothes, schooling in its entirety, and vocational training leading to a secure and better future, these kids, these flawed seeds and their damaged beauty have had their futility redeemed. This is a letter written by a father of one of the boys from Sunlight House Shelter. For boys. Dear Tuan, I am crying while I write to you. I have only one wish, that you try to study well and be well behaved, to be a good student so that in the future you will become a good person. Then you can come back with us and that will be our honour and pride. Please don't do anything wrong to put your family down. We understand that you had to go away from us, even though it is a hard and lonely life for you now in Saigon. Why did you have to go? At home, we don't have enough to eat. But now, because Sunlight House covers you and gives you new life, please try hard so that your carers at the shelter can be happy. Because of our family situation, you should understand that you are lucky to have generous people caring for you. You must think of this as the best blessing of our family. Try to listen to your teachers, and then in the future, you will become a useful person in your life and for our country. Never listen to any bad person and become a bad street boy who could do bad things. You would never put your head up again. Remember this. We hope you are well and have a happy new year in Saigon. Through you, send our regards to all your teachers and friends, your loving parents. In 1998, the Loretto program began teaching English to blind and vision impaired. I know blind is the wrong word to use, possibly in Western society. Vision impaired, but blind is still used in Vietnam, so excuse me if I say that. Well, wow, these children are so blessed. Their disability stops them from doing absolutely nothing. In year six, if these kids are integrated into mainstream schools, they must begin to learn English. I might add, previously they had to learn Russian. And so the Loretto program, we start them learning English in year two so that on entering classes next to their sighted peers in year six, they can at least be at the forefront in one subject. For a sighted person, units one to 20 of the English textbook might be that thick. Units one and two in Braille are this thick, so the kids are carrying around enormous books, and it is a disadvantage. This school is a very, very special place for me, one of pulsating aliveness, 
and life. Why are there so many vision impaired kids? The causes are many. One of the main results is because of Agent Orange, the chemical sprayed during the Vietnam War. And the effects of this are coming out in second and third generations. Another big cause is the lack of good nutrition during pregnancy. There are families at the school who have two, three, four children all blind. One family of three boys is proving that their disability cannot stop them from advancing academically. Min is into his second year at university studying special education. Man has just started at the music conservatorium and his tenor voice will see him becoming another Andrea Bocelli and the third boy, Tuan, is completing year 12. This one's a bit hard for me. I remember being utterly shocked the first time I saw a vision impaired child with no eyeballs at all. And when giving a talk to some students in Australia once, one of those students asked me, how does he cry? Anyone can answer that question even on a physical level for me, I would like to know. The Loretta Program's partnership at the School for the Blind also sees our support for music, sport, massage, life skills, a new school van, braille paper and extra nutrition for the kids there. In September last year, we opened a new complex at the school, learning life skills and information technology. The kids there have a special software called JAWS, where they listen to the screen and they be, can be typing away and um, it will tell them when they've made a mistake. And I have to, in retrospect, that wonderful word that I keep using, think that it is perhaps the most futuristic project that we have ever undertaken in our 11 years. Sometimes I can be on my way to school in that traffic on my motorbike, feeling so tired, and I can't imagine how I'll teach for three hours. Such a feeling disappears after two minutes in the classroom. Recently I was teaching year two, the word ice cream begins with I. No better way than to undertake real experiential learning than to have an ice cream. Their enjoyment was beyond words for them. One little boy said, Miss Trish, this is the first time I have had an ice cream in a cone. There's just one other point that I wish to make about the School for the Blind, and that is the kids at this school, a number of them have low vision. And in fact, these kids, I think, are the anawim, the poorest at the school. Being a school for blind children, I always feel that the kids with low vision are quite separated from the little bit of vision that they already have. It often appears to me that the little they have is negated. In 2001, we built a special school for intellectually disabled, I know, again, the word is intellectually challenged, children. In this one suburb alone, there are 1,500 intellectually disabled kids. Again, we constructed and built this school and for the past eight years, the Loretto Program has supported this learning environment through innumerable educational resources, through supplementing wages for art, music, sport, yoga and carpet bowls teachers, by setting up a library and a quiet room, donating rehabilitation equipment, maintaining computer education and also granting scholarships to assist very poor families. Another huge investment that we have made at this special school has been to develop the teachers' professional skills and proficiency through concentrated and ardent training workshops. We have enabled the teachers to undertake practical and theoretical seminars in a diverse range of topics related to special education. What a gift to be able to share the lives of these very special kids. It is striking that in a society that places so much emphasis on independence, intellectual prowess and social position, growing numbers of people are now so willing to accept children and adults who don't, do not match these ideals. 
Jean Vanier, founder of the Worldwide Lash Communities, sees disability not as a problem to be solved, but as an aspect of hum being human that needs to be understood. Vanier urges people to recognize the beauty of difference and the importance of vulnerability. And for me, gifted by days amongst these precious, precious children, the Lord's house for the moment, my work here has become a prayer, an experiential union with God in love, working itself out and expressing itself as activity informed and directed by God. As I stand here now, and we'll be running back to next week, a construction of a second campus for this special school has begun some two months ago. This new campus will be a vocational training centre to include cooking, hospitality, music, further computer education, tailoring, woodwork, art, handicrafts and horticulture for older students, thus freeing up space in the first campus to further develop the early intervention program. Two new projects begun only six months ago are assisting another special school through the provision of significant nutritional help so that these children can stay at school all day. About 18 months ago, government assistance, Vietnamese government assistance of $10 a month was withdrawn if a disabled child could stand on two feet for one second. Therefore, these children who lost that $10 were only able to go to school in the morning and then were on the streets begging for their lunch. Additionally, the Loretta program has provided playground and music equipment for the kids at this school. The second project in Kanzur district that we support is a shelter for orphaned and disadvantaged children through a more sustainable help in education along with increased living needs, recreational equipment and clothing. I wish to make two final points before I conclude my presentation. When the Vietnamese people made their boat journeys of escape, they would carry two things. One was a small bag of dried meat, and the other was a huge, as big as this one here, picture of Mary, the mother of Jesus. I belong to the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we're also known as the Loretto Sisters, but it is the Vietnamese people who have taught me to cherish a deep, deep love of Mary. When they sing and pray to her, they use the word me, me oi. They plead with her, me oi. Translated into English as mother, but barely with the depth and the passion that this word is spoken and has meaning in Vietnamese. What a wonderful woman to have in our lives. She is tender, she is strong. She is a woman of courage and faith. She listened long and lovingly to the word of God, perplexed and puzzled, and yet poised with a freedom of spirit to say yes. Mary, um, Ellen, I hope you're watching this. We talked about this woman last night. The other final point. When I arrived in, in Vietnam 15 years ago, I was and still am very, very quiet about what I am. The communist government in Vietnam, and I didn't put any of this on the PowerPoint in case I was pulled up at the airport or whatever. The communist government monitors churches and church ministry very, very carefully and vigilantly. Permissions are needed for meetings, lectures and conferences, but not to worship. Sometimes approvals are requested and sometimes not. Sometimes they are granted, more often not. Catholic groups gather quietly and discreetly and to answer your question, Philip, I never join them, rarely visit presbyteries and convents, nor get too close to a religious affairs. I'm somewhat undercover about being a religious. Not unlike our foundress, Mary Ward, 
born in the 16th century and who lived during the worst period of persecution against recusant Catholics who refused to attend the state church. Mary Ward also belonged to underground Catholic networks. I see having to live a little like this, not in community, I live alone, and with a diminished spiritual input, as such a tangible taste of my vow of poverty. It is very likely that the government knows what I am. Last year in September, I, oh, I've always got a policeman following me, but I am totally free of that now. I used to worry about it. It's a little bit like Jesus before Pilate or whichever one it was. And, and, and Jesus said, tell me what I've done wrong. So they probably know what I am. Don't care if they can catch up with me on my motorbike. Well, then good on them. Follow me. Come and stay at my house and sleep at my place all night if they want to. Unless I am caught being involved in any kind of proselytizing, which I certainly do not do, then I think I am safe and sound. The kids never call me sister, but Miss Trish. The way of being, this way of being has also taught me that the church needs to reach beyond its doors and to be present as interpreters of people's experiences, reaching out to the world beyond our church. Doors is an incarnational priority. In Vietnam, there are innumerable chances to get on board with expertise and resources, maybe evasively, in standing wholeheartedly within the secular cycle. Women's Day, Teacher's Day, Children's Day, National Disability Day, World AIDS Day, even Liberation Day for South Vietnam, what we call the Fall of Saigon, they call Liberation Day, which is actually the 30th of April. I see such a need to take these days seriously along with the Vietnamese people, as these times offer a remarkable opportunity to be involved in shaping popular spirituality, developing largely beyond our reach or influence. And secondly, we have a theologically, perhaps evasively, and practical contribution to make, and we will surely find out that we have something to learn ourselves. Unless the Lord builds a house. I pray for us all that we can walk into each day as God's builder and that whoever we meet, we meet in God's own way. I pray that we will prepare ourselves to see with the heart that each day is blessed of God, chosen by God with his own hand. Then every person we meet is a gift of God. Every circumstance we meet is a gift of God. I pray that we be attentive to grace loose in the world, opening eyes and hearts wide enough to search for traces of God's nearness in our own desire, our wanting, our longing, our beholding what is beautiful to look at, tasting what is good to savour, knowing what is true and trying to do the right thing in love freely, all the while preparing for the God who comes again and again and yet again in our desiring. One last request is, please pray for me daily that I stay strong in God's ministry. Thank you.